Okay, good morning everyone, uh, and uh, as usual we carry on uh, from where we left off yesterday. Uh, and just to remind you, we are looking at what is called the six kinds of recollections, uh, six ways of bringing uh, joy to the mind, really, uh, and to brighten the mind and to make it ready for meditation practice. Uh, and so all of these things are ultimately about meditation, uh, but uh, they are also about right view, uh, because they are about thinking about the Buddha in the right way, uh, understanding what the Dhamma uh, really is about, uh, and also understanding uh, the results that people can expect when they practice these teachings. Uh, so uh, these are uh, kind of standard aspects of uh, meditation practice uh, in Buddhism. Yesterday we started looking at the qualities of the Buddha, uh, what it means to be a Buddha, how we can relate to the Buddha, and uh, we're going to continue with that now. Uh, and this particular thing that we're looking at, this is the, called the Itipiso formula, is what he chanted around the whole Theravadan Buddhist world. Uh, and uh, so it's a kind of a very central uh, idea in Buddhism, uh, what the Buddha actually is, uh, yeah, what sort of person he has become. Uh, and why it is uh, very useful to take the Buddha as one's teacher. So uh, yesterday we had a look at the uh, this starting off with that blessed one is perfected, fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct. And we'll be discussing the idea of accomplished in knowledge and conduct. And I was talking quite a lot about these two factors of being a Buddha. On the one hand, the wisdom, the insight into the human condition, understanding how we can find greater satisfaction in life, uh, how we can move away from suffering and problems uh, and find more uh, peace, happiness, all these kind of things. Uh. And so really the Buddha is talking to us, to the very thing that really everyone in the world wants. Uh, this is what craving is about. Craving is really this uh, drive towards finding satisfaction in the world. Uh, but it turns out craving tends to misdirect us, uh, and that is the problem. Uh. Whereas the Buddha understands this issue and he tells us where we should go looking if we want real happiness. And of course that is the spiritual path. So that is the wisdom side and then the compassion side I mentioned yesterday, that the Buddha is only motivated by compassion. There are no ulterior motives. He doesn't have any interest in the world. There's nothing for him to get from the world. So he is motivated only by compassion. There's something very very powerful about that. Yeah? When a teacher only comes from compassion, uh, there's something very beautiful and very it draws you in because these are the kind of teachers that we want in the world. Uh, parents who come out from compassion, teachers who come from compassion, uh, and the Buddha is the highest example of that. Uh. And then we have this idea of conduct. Yeah? The Buddha is uh, accomplished in knowledge and conduct. Uh, what does that exactly mean? Uh, and what it means is that the uh, uh, behavior of the Buddha is, um, uh, matches uh, with his teachings. Uh, yeah, there's not as if he behaves in one way and then he teaches something else. Uh, what he says is what he does, and what he does is what he says. Uh, and uh, this is very useful uh, because it means that there is a way uh, in which we can evaluate a teacher. Uh, if it is a teacher worthy of our respect, uh, of our confidence, uh, or are they not? Uh, and the way you evaluate that is actually by looking at them uh, and seeing if their con conduct is in accordance with their teachings. Uh, and someone who is awakened is supposed to not have any anger, right? So if you see anger, okay, wait a minute, okay, something might be wrong here. Uh, or someone who is a bit, you know, inconsiderate or, or whatever, uh, uh, greedy, uh, yeah, what was that? famous, um, uh, some of these famous gurus, they are very famous for kind of amassing goods. Uh, 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 <laughs> they're, they're real scallywags, some of these gurus. Uh, was that famous scallywag in the, in the US? Uh, Rajneesh. Rajneesh, that's the one. Uh, he's a very famous scallywag, yeah. And he had, I don't know how many Rolls Royces he had. Uh, and his saying, his saying was, I'm so, I'm so detached. Uh, I'm not even attached to detachment. Uh, <laughs> hence, hence all my Rolls Royces. Uh, you know, some people can be so glib, right? They kind of have this kind of ability with words, and it, it sounds really good until you think about it. Actually, this is complete nonsense. And <laughs> but um, yeah, so the conduct should be congruent with the, 
the insight or the teachings that you have. And if there is a discrepancy between the two, uh, and you know that there is a problem, uh, yeah, this is very useful because it means that we can make some judgments in the world and about who is worthy of uh, uh, to, to be taken as a teacher. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and the Buddha invites you specifically. There's a very nice sutta called the Vimangsaka Sutta in the middle length discourses number forty seven. Uh, 47, uh, where he invites people to actually investigate him. Uh, he says, look at my conduct, look over time, see if it changes. Uh, and if you see anything that looks, uh, you know, and, it, and you will find that it, it's all kind of good, but if it looks dodgy, then of course you should be have a bit more skepticism. Uh, so what does this mean in practice? Or what it means in practice is that if you see things that are look dodgy, uh, you should be skeptical. Uh, yeah? You should not buy into it, regardless of how many other people say this is an enlightened person. And if you are skeptical, you're making bad karma for yourself. This is an arahant. You not, cannot be skeptical. Uh, don't buy into those kind of silly arguments. Uh, it's completely, uh, completely dangerous to think like that. Uh, so um, instead, what you do is you trust your own judgment. Uh, and if you see something that looks dodgy, okay, there's reason, you know there's reason to have some doubt about this person. Uh, but also don't be overconfident about your understanding, uh, because sometimes it may be our understanding isn't quite right. Uh, someone may seem in certain ways not to be enlightened, but actually enlightenment is kind of difficult. Is it really anger? Are they maybe being a bit assertive perhaps? Uh, sometimes you see the Buddha, the way he acts in the suttas, uh, it sounds quite, almost a bit harsh sometimes. Uh, yeah, there's one example from the suttas is where uh, all of these lay people, all these Brahmins, they come to the monastery and they're standing outside the gate and they want to make an offering to the Buddha because the Buddha is becoming famous. Uh, but they are really noisy, right? Really, really noisy. Yeah. And the Buddha says, well, who are all these people like fishermen? Uh, you know, catching a hole outside of the gates of the monastery. Yeah. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, because they're just too noisy. Yeah, I, I enjoy solitude and peace. And then he has this conversation with his attendant, and he attendant, please, please see them. Yeah, they come all this way too. And uh, so I'm not sure if the Buddha actually intended all along not to see them, or whether he just was making a point that uh, this is the detriment of being famous. Uh, all of these people come around, they're just creating uh, difficulties. Yeah. And so then eventually he relents and he, he, it seems like he sees those people. Huh? So sometimes you have to be also understand the limits of your own judgment. It's very hard, it can be hard to judge these things. Huh? At the same time, be, if you think that there's something that looks dodgy, huh? uh, be careful. That's kind of the uh, idea here. Huh? And then over time you can make a better judgment about these things. Huh? So conduct should be right. Someone who is enlightened should essentially be kind, caring, compassionate, peaceful, right? All of these qualities should be there, the kind of qualities you expect. No ego, right? One of those beautiful things about sitting next to someone like Ajahn Brahm is that there is no ego there. There's this feeling that it's empty. You know, often there all the monks are around and he kind of sits there, yeah, and he doesn't really say anything, and he's just quiet. And there's a feeling that, almost this feeling of emptiness, there's nothing really going on there. And it's a very beautiful feeling here. Yeah. There's no feeling of, you know, that you have to say anything. There's no sense that you are going to be manipulated by, by someone like that. Uh, there's this feeling of just peace, uh, just beautiful qualities, uh, without any of those uh, uh, problems that we associate with egos and with senses of self. Uh, it's very, uh, very, very attractive when you see these things in real life like that. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I take Ajahn Brahm to be my teacher. And for me, I lived with him for 30 years. Uh, and my estimation of him has only gone up uh, all the time, all those 30 years. Uh, that's very unusual. Uh, most people, we get a bit contempt over, uh, you know, familiarity breeds contempt, as the old saying goes. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Uh, and that's kind of really, really powerful. Uh, so, um, uh, and this is the kind of thing we should look out for. When we see these kind of qualities in people, it's very, very attractive. Uh, so be careful. And Ajahn Brahm is really famous, right? He's one of the most famous monks in the world. It's like the Dalai Lama, and then there's maybe Thich Nhat Hanh, and there's kind of Ajahn Brahm. It's almost like that. Uh, it's like... Uh, so, um, you'd think someone who was famous would be affected by the fame, but that is not the feeling you get with Ajahn Brahm. Uh, 
And I once asked him about this, and he said, well, if you get affected by fame, you're just foolish. Eh? And of course, the reason is because it is, like the Buddha says in the suttas, it's like dung happiness. Eh? Yeah? Dung happiness is great for worms, eh? but not for human beings. Eh? <laughs> dung is nice and warm, right? For the, for the worm, ah, oh, it's nice and warm, so much food everywhere. Wow, dung. Eh? Don't get me out of this dung. Eh? Actually, get out of the dung. Eh? <laughs> Dung is not kind of, it's a lower kind of happiness. Yes, it may be warm. Okay, yes, maybe you can eat it, but you have to be pretty desperate. <laughs> but <laughs> don't hang out in the dung. Yeah? Get out of the dung. I, I don't know if you know the famous story with Ashan Brahm, the worm and his lovely pile of dung. Yeah? Yeah? This is kind of a beautiful story found in the book Opening the Door of Your Heart. Yeah? And it's this story of a worm in the dung yeah? and then his friend who is a deva. Has been reborn, has been reborn in the dung, one has been reborn as a deva, and the, the fellow who has been reborn as a deva thinks, okay, my friend has been reborn in the dung, that's terrible, let me go and rescue him. So it comes down to the worm, tries to pull him out of the dung, but no, I want to stay in my dung, don't pull me out, and he wriggles out and gets back into the dung. Yeah. And eventually the deva has to give up, he just can't get his friend, the worm, out of the dung, he's so attached to his dung. Yeah. And of course, the, uh, the simile here is that the Deva is like the Buddha trying to pull us out of the dung. Yeah? So we are these kind of uh, worms in the dung. Yeah? <laughs> it's a pretty kind of, the simile is very in your face, but it's kind of to make a point, right? That we don't really see the world in the right way. We are kind of uh, deluded. Uh, that's kind of the point. Uh, so anyway, coming back to the idea of conduct, charana, yeah, the Buddha has very, uh, has a very exceptional conduct, and these are the kind of things you should expect to see in the Buddha, yeah, it's things you see in very inspiring teachers, also in the present day. Yeah. So this is a knowledge and conduct. Uh, then we have the uh, the word holy. Yeah, the word holy here is a translation of the word sugata. sugata. And uh, sugata literally means well, su is well, gata means gone, well gone. That's kind of literally what it means. Uh, and uh, it is used, this kind of word, similar kind of word, sugati, is used as a good destination. That's what it means in the suttas. Uh, and usually refers to rebirth and a good destination. Uh, uh, so here you can take it to mean that someone who has arrived at a good destination in this life is a sugato. He has arrived at a good destination, he is enlightened. Uh, has given up all suffering, yeah, yeah, holy, is that a good translation? Yeah, I guess it's okay, yeah. um, you know, you've become holy, you have given up all of those negative things, you've achieved the highest happiness, I guess that makes you holy in a sense, uh, really depends what you mean by that word, uh, but, uh, so that's kind of the idea between, behind that, the knower of the world, uh, right, we have, I've talked a lot about this idea again, uh, knower of the world means, uh, understanding all the kind of potential rebirths that we can have. Uh, because only by understanding the potential rebirths uh, can you make an evaluation of whether it is worthwhile hanging out in samsara or not. Uh, so if you know these are the kind of rebirths that last for so and so long, uh, then you kind of get reborn somewhere else. Uh, once you start to see kind of that overall picture, uh, that is when you can make a decision about what is appropriate. Should I give it all up? Should I go somewhere else? Should I get reborn here? What should I do? You have to understand the potential before you can decide whether it's worthwhile escaping or not from all of this. So the Buddha does that and there are some kind of nice very charming little suttas when the Buddha talks about his awakening and he says I didn't call myself awakened until I had seen these devas in my mind's eye. Yeah, it's like a nimitta again. And then I went, I, I didn't call myself awake until I actually met with those devas, uh, had a chat with them, uh, yeah, hung out with them, uh, <laughs> associated with them, uh, asked them about what kind of food they have and how long they live and what kind of karma brought them there, whether I had lived in those realms before. Uh, all of these things are part of the awakening experience, yeah, or, or maybe not the experience of awakening, but the extended um, inquiry into the nature of the world uh, that the Buddha undertakes probably after his awakening experience maybe not entirely sure exactly when it happens but it happens at some point uh. so he knows the world in this way once you know the world fully uh, 
and you understand the mechanism that drives you from one birth to another one, in other words, the laws of karma and these kind of things, and once you understand all that, then you can make a decision. Actually, this is not worth pursuing. I need to get out of this. And so then he then finds the cessation of this rebirth process by understanding dependent origination and dependent cessation. And then he comes to an end of all of this. So he knows the world in this way. It means understanding happiness and suffering yeah, and evaluating whether what is actually worthwhile. Yeah. comes back to happiness and suffering. Yeah. That is why the first noble truth is phrased in terms of suffering. Yeah. And of course the implication there is that if you know suffering, well, you also know happiness. Yeah. The two always have together sukha and dukkha in Pali. Yeah. Some of the most important Pali words. Dukkha, Sukha. Sukha sounds better than dukkha, right? Uh, so you, you can just feel the meaning of the word and you know straight away which one is the good one, which one is the bad one. Uh. So he is a knower of the world, holy, uh, the supreme guide for those who wish to train. Uh. And uh, again, he is the supreme guide, again, because of his, uh, his insight into the human uh, nature. Uh, and also because he, of his compassion, he is supreme, because he guides us out of compassion. Uh, this ability, that full insight together with compassion is a very powerful combination. Uh, yeah, because uh, it means that you are teaching for the right reasons, but you also know exactly what you're supposed to be teaching. Yeah? So he's the supreme guide for those who wish to train. Uh, uh, this is the, um, uh, the Anutta Pudisa. Uh, how does it go? The supreme Purisa um, Dhamma Sarati. The Dhamma here means tameable people. That's kind of literally what it means. Uh, so it's the supreme guide for tameable people. Uh, so you have to be tameable. Uh, that's kind of the requirement here. Uh, so uh, the fact that you are here means that you are at least partly tameable, right? That's good. Uh, you're kind of on the right track. Uh, those people who say at Buddhist retreats, nah, that's, that's for idiots. I'm not going to go on the Buddhist retreat. They're not, they're not tameable. Yeah? There's no, ch no chance for them. Uh, uh, so, but you give people a chance. Uh, yeah? You make the Dhamma available in the world. Uh, and if people want to come, they're welcome. If they don't want to come, okay, that's fine too. It's really up to them. Uh, so you're the supreme guide for tameable people. Uh, and the way you make yourself tameable uh, is to kind of practice these teachings. The fewer defilements you have, the more right view you have, uh, the more tameable you become, uh, because you're leaning in that right direction. Uh. He is teacher of gods and humans. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, this is a, all of these are actually very rich, and uh, we could go on much longer about these things. I think I will go on for a while with this last one, because now we've come into the conclusion. Uh, and, uh, of course, an important point of the idea of being teacher for gods and humans uh, is the idea that uh, just because someone is a god uh, doesn't mean that they have necessarily have much insight. Uh, especially from the Buddhist point of view, a god is just someone who has been reborn in a particular realm because of their good actions. Uh, it doesn't mean that they understand the nature of reality, even if they are very powerful in these kind of things. Uh, so this is like setting the Buddha on top of the hierarchy in the world. Usually the hierarchy is the god on the top, humans below. In Buddhism, the Buddha on top, the gods below. Right? That kind of inverts this hierarchy in the world, which is fascinating. So, you know, God, the Buddha is the teacher of God. It's kind of nice, it's nice isn't that a nice kind of way of thinking about things? And uh, don't say that to Christians, uh, because they might get not, not like it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so it's kind of, it inverts things in a beautiful way. Why do we assume that these gods have insight, just because they are powerful, just because they are there in some way? Uh, and, um, and of course, one of the things that this does, because in ancient India they believed in Brahman, Brahman is the kind of the universal consciousness which is always there in the background. Uh, and then you have in this Arya Pariyasana Sutta we looked at before, the Noble Search, uh, where Brahma, yeah, Brahma Sahampati, yeah, who kind of personif personifies this universal Brahmanic, or Brahman, Brahmanic Bra Brahman principle, he comes down to the Buddha, bows down to the Buddha. Yeah, this is very symbolic. Yeah. This is the highest kind of god in Hinduism, the Brahmanical teaching comes down, bows down to the Buddha and asks the Buddha, please teach, yeah, because the world is perishing unless we get these teachings. 
And of course, the whole idea behind this is this idea that now there is a new teaching available, and it, which is higher than the previous one. Uh, and then uh, those people who are wise, they will kind of accept this new teaching. Yeah. It's a very symbolic, and I, I'm not sure if it is uh, just Buddhist propaganda or what, but it's uh, whether it really happened that way. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's meaningful, uh, and I think it is uh, true, in a sense, from a Buddhist perspective. Uh, so the Buddha is teacher of gods and humans. So just because you see a god, uh, don't be mesmerized or hypnotized by that god. Uh, imagine that you saw something very powerful, you know, the light, kind of bright light, full of loving kindness and all of these kind of things, and you get this very powerful feeling here. Yeah. And uh, of course, it's very easy to kind of bow down and say, oh yes, now I know there is a supreme god. But actually, you know nothing of the sort. All you know is that there was a light, there was a good feeling of loving kindness, and it had a very positive feeling, but you don't actually know what it means. And this is one of those big mistakes that we tend to uh, make, yeah, that we jump to conclusions because we want to, to jump to those conclusions because uh, it is very attractive uh, to have some kind of God in our life who can sort things out for us and uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, I think a lot of the attraction of a God figure uh, is that it takes some responsibility away from us. Uh, it puts the responsibility in someone else's hand. They will sort it out for us. Uh, it's like a daddy or a mummy in the sky, right? Uh, <laughs> who will kind of sort out our problems. I think it is a little bit like that, uh, because it makes life more bearable. Life is difficult enough as it is, uh, but it's dangerous, right? Uh, what if there is no mummy and daddy in the sky? Uh, what if there is no one who can actually sort out your bad actions? What if you are ultimately responsible for your own conduct? Uh, well, then you have a very serious problem. Uh, and the serious problem is compounded by the fact that you only find out after you die. Uh, it's too late to find out after you die. Uh, that's kind of, that doesn't work. To me, the really satisf satisfying thing with Buddhism is precisely that you are responsible for yourself. It's good because this uh, gives you agency, it gives you an ability to, uh, to do something with your life. Uh, putting things in the hands of a god who may not exist, uh, that to me is the not very wise at all. Uh, and yet that is what the majority of humanity seems to do. Uh, don't follow the majority here. Uh, go with where wisdom is found. Uh, it is empowering to feel that you are responsible for your life. It is empowering and scary at the same time. But it is empowering because it means you can actually do something about it instead of putting your life in the hands of some unknown quantity who may turn out to be evil. Do we know that God is good? Look at the Bible and you wonder whether the God is good or bad. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. Okay, in the Old Testament, definitely God was pretty bad. In the New Testament, a bit better. But it's all a bit dicey here. And a bit uncertain there. Uh, I wouldn't want to put my life into the hands of that God. Uh, Jeep is uh, scary here. Uh, I'd rather take responsibility for myself. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, this is the idea, yeah? The Buddha is above uh, these uh, gods. Uh, but uh, God, teacher of gods and humans, uh, what does it mean that the Buddha is our teacher? Uh, in what sense is that true? Uh, because the Buddha was around two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, he was in a very different society from our own. Yeah, actually, India is kind of interesting because India is almost like at the center of the world. And actually, it is quite, in many ways, quite close to uh, Western societies. We have the same root. Yeah, the language is rooted in the same thing. Yeah. Uh, there is a continuation of culture all the way from India all the way to, you know, to the westernmost part of Europe. The continuation of culture all the way along. Yeah. And of course, Indian culture was also influential in East Asia because it went to China, yeah, and then to Japan and Korea. So Indian culture has been incredibly influential in the world. Uh, I would say maybe until recent times, uh, the most influential culture in the world uh, because those ideas have really spread out everywhere. Yeah. And um, so, but still, it is kind of a bit alien. It's far away, a long time ago. Uh, so how is it that the Buddha is our teacher? And this is a very interesting thing to contemplate. Uh, you, when the Buddha gave a teaching, he normally would have a crowd in front of him. And normally we would think he was teaching those people in front of him. But actually, that is not quite true. And this is where it gets interesting. Because one of the things that the Buddha says in the suttas is that when he starts to teach, he sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, 
Dhamma Chakka Pavatana. This is one of the suttas, one of the very beautiful suttas found in the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. And setting in wheel the motion of setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma means that once you kind of uh, unleash the Dhamma on society, <laughs> when you unleash the Dhamma on society, maybe that's the wrong word, it sounds a bit too uh, too kind of uh, violent. See, when you when you make the Dhamma available in society, right? Uh, uh, there is a power to the Dhamma. It is so powerful that when people hear it, uh, they take it on board and it travels on from generation to generation. Uh, and people <coughs> practice this, they gain the same insight as the Buddha, they become Arahant stream enters and they pass it on to the next generation. And it moves on, it rolls on uh, with a certain momentum. A wheel, when you set it rolling, has a certain momentum. It goes for a certain time and then it falls over eventually. Uh, in the same way, the Dhamma has a momentum in the world, uh, rolling on from generation to generation, from century to century, from culture to culture. Uh, and now the Dhamma is clearly a world religion, right? It is found everywhere in the world. Uh, there is no continent on which it is not found. I'm sure there are some Buddhists even in Antarctica. Uh, yeah, there's not that many people there, but I'm sure there are some Buddhists among them. Uh, they're everywhere. We should go down. Maybe we should send a mission to Antarctica and convert some of those people living in the research stations down there. I, I think the penguins are a lost cause, but uh, we can uh, <laughs> we can go for it. anyway. Uh, so uh, the Buddha, when he taught, he already knew that he was setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. Huh? Yeah, so he knew that there would be people in the future, huh, in different cultures, listening to these teachings. Huh? Yeah. Huh? I don't think he knew specifically about us right here, but you know, something like this. Yeah? And so what that means is that the way he taught, uh, he taught in a way that was accessible, or would be accessible for any human being, regardless of culture, regardless of background. He taught in a very universal way, from the very beginning, uh, because he knew that these teachings would travel on. Uh. So when he's giving the teaching to the people in front of him, uh, he's not just teaching those people. Uh, he has in mind all of humanity at that particular point, anyone who is willing to listen to these teachings. Uh, and what that means, of course, is that we are immediate, almost, disciples of the Buddha, because he has us in mind uh, when he gives these teachings. Uh, yeah, the Buddha is actually thinking of us. Uh, every human being on this planet uh, kind of is in his mind when he gives these teachings. Uh, and that is why these teachings, when you read them, you can actually relate to them, because they talk about universal aspects of humanity that actually have to do with how we all are. Yeah? Craving the desire to be happy, the wanting to overcome suffering in life, the defilements of the mind, the, the ability to develop our minds, the ability to have loving kindness in the world. Uh, these are universal human qualities. Uh, uh, are applicable to everyone. And this is what the Buddha talks about in the suttas. Uh, and so the Buddhism is a world religion like no other. There is no religion in the world where actually the founder has a universal outlook from the very beginning, thinking about all humanity. In fact, it is the only world religion in the right sense of the word. It is true that Christianity and Islam, they exist everywhere in the world, and so in that sense they are a world religion. But when you look at the roots of Christianity and Islam, you realize they were not a world religion at all. They were the exact opposite of a world religion. They were a parochial, small-minded religion coming out somewhere in the Middle East. And they were the covenant between a small people. There were maybe, how many Jews were there in the Middle East at that time? Ten, few tens of thousands maybe of Jews. And there was the covenant, the agreement between those Jews and their specific God. Other people had other gods. Yeah. And then they were fighting with each other. And then they would ask their God to help them when they had troubles with the neighboring tribe. And then the God in return would ask for sacrifice. Sacrifice your son for me. It was that kind of very small religion, very parochial, very backward in very many ways. And then this is what gradually then developed into Christianity. And of course the Christianity we have now is completely different in many ways. But that is its roots. Its roots is small-minded, parochial, nothing to do with universal principles. In the New Testament, maybe, certainly not in the Old Testament. I don't even know these books all that well. I can never be bothered to read them. They were completely uninteresting to me. But I read enough to know that it is not particularly interesting. Some aspects are interesting, but a lot of it is outright disturbing. 
And um, so, um, for this reason, um, Buddhism has like a universal, has a very special place in the world. Uh, the only religion that is truly based on universal principles from the very beginning. And of course, that is what we should expect. If the Buddha's awakening experience really was an awakening experience to the nature of the human heart and mind, it should expect this teaching to have been based on universal principles, right? That is exactly what we should expect, because he teaches based on direct insight into the nature of the human being. So when the Buddha teaches, and when you read the suttas, remember that the Buddha is teaching you, He's teaching me, he's teaching each one of us. Yeah? He is your direct teacher in a very immediate sense. And when you feel, when you realize that the Buddha actually is teaching you when you read the suttas, and you realize that maybe he has this profound insight into the human condition, and he's driven only by compassion, all of these things coming together make it incredibly powerful. If you feel your hair standing on end when you read the suttas, good on you. That means you're on the right track. You have a feeling of awe, you have a feeling of being in the presence of something very special. That is what it should feel like when you read the suttas. So if you can feel that, then it's great. I have to admit, it's a little bit difficult to feel that in the suttas, because they are very kind of a little bit artificial, a bit stylized, they come from an oral tradition which makes it a little bit difficult to relate to them like that. But occasionally, when you read the suttas, you will get these feelings. Occasionally, the Buddha kind of shines through as a real person who is teaching you in a very real way. At those times, you can get these goosebumps, yeah, and you kind of feel, wow, this is really, really powerful stuff. So the Buddha is your teacher in a very real way. Yeah, remember that, and try to use these perceptions to make the suttas come alive in a way that they otherwise never would. There is one more thing that I usually tell people at this time uh, while we're going through the uh, qualities of the Buddha. And uh, this is what I recommend you to do sometimes if you can. Uh, the idea is to uh, imagine meeting the Buddha. Uh, imagine what that would be like. Because when you imagine meeting with the Buddha, uh, he becomes much more real as a human being. Yeah? Because you're actually meeting face to face with the Buddha. Uh, so what would it be like to meet the Buddha? Imagine we are here on this retreat, this little wood up there. Imagine the Buddha sitting at the root of one of those large trees up there. Yeah, um, It's a little bit small forest for the Buddha. I think he likes larger forests and get away. There's too many people in the area for him. He wants to be far away. But uh, still, imagine that you go up there. And you have heard, because you are in a Buddhist group, you have heard that the Buddha is up there at the root of a tree. And so you decide, I have a problem, Ajahn Ramali doesn't know how to answer this problem, so I'm going to go to the Buddha, I'm going to the real source. Yeah? <laughs> so you go up into that wood, and then as you go up, you start to feel a bit of trepidation. Yeah? This is the Buddha, this is the kind of the greatest spiritual master in recorded human history. This is someone with an incredible reputation. This is someone who is supposed to be able to read minds. Are you ready to have your mind read? And so you walk into the forest, you feel a bit nervous, you feel a bit unsure, what is this master going to do? You, you kind of know that he's supposed to be kind, but you don't actually, you haven't ever seen it in practice. Uh, and so you are uncertain. Uh, and then uh, as you walk into the forest, uh, you see a monk just in front of you, yeah, somewhere in the distance, uh, sitting at the foot of a tree. Uh, and then uh, when you see this monk, you know this must be the Buddha, because uh, this is what you have been told. Uh, and you start walking towards the Buddha, and as you walk towards the Buddha, you start to feel the field of this person around this person. There's something very powerful about certain people. You come into their presence and you actually feel that you are calming down simply by being in the presence of that person. And the Buddha is like that, except a thousandfold more than most other people. And so you feel the sense of peace. You feel the sense of benevolence uh, by being in the presence uh, of uh, someone like that. And you start to calm down a little bit. Uh, you have less trepidation. Uh, you start to feel more at ease. Uh, I don't know if you have felt this sometimes in, in life, when you are in the presence of someone, and you really start to feel peaceful because of the power of that individual. Uh, 
or you go to a certain building that has been used for meditation for a long time. Uh, and when you go into that building, uh, you feel peaceful simply because of the vibes in that building. Yeah. By the way, there's a new word for vibes, apparently. Juju. Yeah, the juju in that building is really powerful. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that word, but it's a word I learned in California recently, and all the words start in California, and then they spread out. So, uh, <laughs> the juju. And the feeling is just very powerful sometimes. Uh, and you walk into that building, and I've seen so many examples of this, and I've seen many people who feel these things. Uh, and now you are coming into the presence of the Buddha, and you feel these things much more than you have ever felt it before. You start to calm down, you start to feel more at ease, and you approach the Buddha, and as you approach him, you feel more and more the power of this kind of... hard to know how these things happen, I'm not sure exactly how it happens, but it somehow it seems to happen. More and more peaceful, more and more benevolence. And you go all the way up to the Buddha. And when you come up to the Buddha, the Buddha looks at you. <laughs> And he says, uh, take a seat, sit down. And so you sit down. And when the Buddha asks you, well, are you well? And you say, yeah, I'm good, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And the Buddha says, have you come from afar? Oh, I come from the Nightingale Center. <laughs> <laughs> and the Buddha says, okay, good. Um, have you had enough to eat? Oh, yeah, um, everything is fine. Okay, so why have you come? Oh, I had an argument with my wife, <laughs> or my husband, or whatever, yeah. And the Buddha, he doesn't think that you are foolish for coming there with a simple little thing like that. Because the Buddha knows these are the things that concern us in life. These are the issues that are important to us. A wife or a husband is maybe the person that is closest to us. So of course it matters that we have a good relationship with them. And of course we want to sort it out. So the Buddha speaks to you in a peaceful kindly way. Yeah. And he says, remember to have compassion. Yeah. Remember we're all suffering. Yeah. Remember life is difficult for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Go back yeah, and ask your wife for forgiveness. Even if she was wrong, still ask her for forgiveness. Yeah. And then uh, it, things will work out, I guarantee you. Yeah. A very simple teaching. Yeah. Buddha's, uh, if you read the sutta, the kind of teachings he gives, uh, often so simple. Uh, they're so beautiful and straight to the, straight to the point. Uh, it's not very complicated. Yes, there is dependent origination, but that is a rare teaching in the suttas. Eh? And this is the power of the word of the Buddha, the simplicity, eh? and how it goes directly to the heart. Eh? And the most important part of the message is not the words, eh? it is the way that they are delivered. Eh? It is how you feel in the presence. Eh? That is what makes this word go deep inside. Eh? And you know that when you hear these words of the Buddha, you know you will never forget these words. Eh? Because the presence is so powerful, uh, even though you sort of knew it already, uh, what he was going to say, uh, yeah, uh, still uh, you know that this is more powerful words uh, than you've ever, ever heard in your entire life. Uh, simple, uh, straightforward. Uh, and then you get up from your seat. Uh, and now, having heard the Buddha in this way, the only thing you want to do in your whole life uh, is to bow down to the Buddha, uh, because you understand that you are in the presence of something extraordinary. Uh, yeah, and so you bow down with tears in your eyes uh, because you know this is really special. Uh. And this is one of those things that you hear about when people bow down to the Buddha in the right way. Uh. Someone like Ajahn Brahm will say sometimes he has tears in his eyes uh, when he bows down to the Buddha uh, because he really understands what the Buddha is. Uh. In the same way, now you have a feeling, you have an intuition uh, what the Buddha is. Uh. And so you bow down, and it's the only thing you want to do in the whole world. And as you do that, uh, your whole heart, your whole mind is inclining towards the Dhamma. Uh, you want to practice the same thing. Uh, and you realize that you're not bowing down to an ego. What is painful in life is bowing down to an ego. Because if you bow down to an ego, there's a feeling that you will be taken advantage of, or someone is gaining a benefit out of that. Uh, the Buddha doesn't gain any benefit of you bowing down to him. Uh, the Buddha probably wants you to leave as quickly as possible. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you know that you are bowing down to something special, to good qualities, to kindness, to peace, uh, to something you also want to aspire for. Uh, that is why it feels so right to bow down. Uh. And then you get up uh, and you walk away. Uh, and when you walk away, you know you will never in your life forget this experience uh, because it's so extraordinarily powerful. Uh. Here is a human being, uh, just like you, uh, 
with someone who has transcended his defilements, transcended his difficulties, uh, and attained something that obviously is really, really worthwhile. Uh, just seeing an arahant in the world uh, is a great benefit. Uh, you have just seen some point, something extraordinary. Uh, you don't know if they're an arahant, uh, but you know it's very special. Uh, and so you walk away, uh, and uh, you're, uh, you're, the residue is a positive trauma. Uh, this is an expression I learned from Ajahn Brahm, the positive trauma. Yeah? A trauma, something that is such a powerful, positive experience uh, that you can never forget it for the rest of your life. Uh, and this drives you on in your practice. Uh, when you leave the Buddha uh, and when you go back home, uh, you are changed. Uh, something has lodged in your mind that never will leave your mind and will keep on guiding you throughout your daily practices. Uh, you will act with more kindness. Uh, you will speak with more kindness. You will think with more kindness from now on. Uh, because this is lodged in a very powerful memory inside of you. Uh, you cannot get it out of your mind. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do uh, on this path. To lodge some of these simple ideas powerful in our mindfulness. Uh, so they guide us at all times. Uh, and this can happen uh, by reading the word of the Buddha in the right way. Uh. So sometimes use your imagination. Build up an idea of who the Buddha was, uh, and you start to get a relationship with the Buddha in an entirely new way. Uh, you really take him as a teacher. Uh. The teachers that we've had in this life, uh, the Buddha is a teacher just like that. The fact that he lived two and a half thousand years ago is completely relevant, uh, because he did teach us, uh, he knew about us, uh, and he gave us these teachings. Uh. So get to know the Buddha, get a feeling for this extraordinary human being. Uh. And then, when you read the suttas, they become far more powerful. Uh. And then when you close your eyes uh, and you think about the Buddha, or you think about the teachings that he gave, uh, or you think about the results of the practice, uh, it actually does give you a sense of uplift, joy, happiness, uh, that then drives the whole meditation experience. So, there you are. These are just some suggestions uh, on how uh, I think it is worthwhile thinking. Uh, uh, please uh, make these things your own in whatever way you feel is appropriate. Uh, these, remember, these are just suggestions. Uh, these are not things that you have to do in this way or whatever, uh, just to give you some ideas, really. Uh. So he's the teacher of gods and humans. Uh, he is awakened and blessed. Uh, Buddha, Bhagavan, are the last two words there. Uh, and um, blessed here, Bhagavan, uh, is a word that is used uh, in the suttas uh, for, uh, or in ancient India, for anyone who is like a lord, or you know, like a lord in the sense of God, uh, yeah, they're called Bhagavans usually, yeah. So once you are reflecting on the Buddha in this way, then this is what happens afterwards, and this of course is very interesting, yeah, because this is the entire purpose of this reflection. Yeah. When a noble disciple recollects the Buddha, the realized one, yeah, their mind is not full of greed, hatred, and delusion. Yeah. Or if you like, desire, ill will, and confusion. Uh, greed, hatred, and delusion is really, are not really the ideal words uh, because uh, it sounds over the top. Yeah? It's about desire, it's about ill will, and it's about being confused about things. Uh, uh, that, that makes them more approachable as terms. Uh, yeah? Because when you think about the Buddha in this way, you are really inclining towards spiritual qualities uh, because you know the Buddha is all about spiritual qualities. Uh, you cannot really be attached to the world and think rightly about the Buddha at the same time. So you give up the worldly thoughts and all you are thinking about at this time is the Buddha. At that time the mind is unswerving, based on the realized one. Unswerving here, the Pali word is ujjo, and ujjo means straight again, right? Your mind is straight, it is not crooked. The defilements are what makes the mind crooked. The good qualities are what straighten out the mind. Yeah? So your mind is straight, right view, right kind of leaning in the right direction. Unswerving is uh, the inspired rendering here. Uh, based on the idea of the realized one. Uh, yeah? The defilements go down, your mind is straight. Uh, a noble disciple whose mind is straight uh, finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching. Uh, finds joy connect with the teaching. Yeah? Yeah, now you can see the purpose I've been talking about all the time, finding joy and happiness in this. Uh, so you find inspiration in the meaning and the teaching. Yeah? And uh, this is called Atta Veda and Dhamma Veda in Pali. Yeah? And uh, Dhamma is of course the teaching of the Buddha, 
And Veda, this word here translated inspiration, uh, is this beautiful word in Pali which has both the idea of knowledge and understanding uh, and also feelings at the same time. Uh, yeah? So you understand what is going on because you are contemplating the Buddha in the right way, especially if you are a noble disciple, you have full understanding of what is going on, but we try to emulate that. Uh, so you understand what the, is going on, that's the understanding aspect, uh, but it comes with feelings. Uh, yeah, feelings arise because you know this is important, you know this is powerful, you know this has really the ability to uplift you and make you a more noble person. And that is why the word inspiration is so useful, because inspiration in English is just like that. If you are inspired by something, it means you have an understanding of what is going on, but you also have an emotion that drives you and motivates you and makes you act. That is what inspiration is about, right? So inspiration is actually a very precise word, I think, in this use in this context, basically translate this word Veda in Pali. So you are inspired. Faith in Buddhism is like that. Sometimes we translate the word sadha as faith. Uh, but the word sadha, it uh, straddles the meaning of confidence and faith. Uh, sadha in Buddhism, faith in Buddhism, is faith derived from understanding. Yeah? So in Buddhism, insight, uh, wisdom, understanding, yeah? uh, and faith uh, actually are all the same thing, basically. Yeah? The more understanding you have, the more faith you have. Uh, and this is this idea of inspiration here. It's, it's uh, faith or inspiration based on seeing something that actually is real now. So you get inspiration in the teaching, because you know these teachings are really just, they are special. In the meaning, the meaning here is what those teachings are pointing to. What is the aim of these teachings? What is the purpose of these teachings? What is the goal? Where are we going? And you start to understand that the goal of these teachings is incredibly lofty, powerful, beautiful, attractive, delightful, wonderful, splendid, etc., etc. It goes on. It's difficult to find enough adjectives to qualify this goal because it is the best goal in the world. So you have to find the best adjectives in the world. Um, whatever. Uh, splendid, splendiferous. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, the goal is so powerful, right? We're heading towards everything we ever wanted in life. In fact, more than we even knew that we wanted. Yeah? This is what I've been saying all along. It's about the meaning of life. This is it. This is the answer to all the questions that we ever had. That is why it is so powerful. You start to see this goal, right? Of course you're going to be inspired. Sometimes we're inspired by all the silly things in life. We're inspired, yeah, by I'm going to get a raise if I work with hard. Okay, I'm going to work hard to get a raise and get a salary raise. Yay, I'm getting more money now. My boss is kind of, I'm going to, whatever it is, we get inspired by all these little things in life as if they are important. But here, it's nothing compared to this, right? Uh, so if we really understood the Dhamma, we would be super inspired. Uh, we would never have a moment in our life we weren't pursuing that goal and having it at the back of our minds uh, that we're heading towards this. Uh. So this is the idea of understanding these teachings uh, and why it matters so much to have a good uh, grasp of what is going on uh, because it does uh, inspire you in this way. Uh. And then comes this beautiful sequence that arises from this joy. Yeah, when you get joy connected with the teaching, then this is what happens. When you're joyful, rapture springs up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. And when they're blissful, the mind becomes stilled. Yeah, and this is exactly what we see in the Anapanasati Sutta that we've been talking about before. Yeah? The state is in the Anapanasati Sutta. You had, uh, uh, you had uh, rapture in there. Yeah? Rapture was mentioned. Probably what is piti. Yeah? That was part of the Anapanasati Sutta. Tranquility. Well, we saw that throughout the Anapanasati Sutta. It was all about tranquilizing things. We have uh, uh, bliss. Uh, bliss here is sukha. That was part, one aspect of the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing. And then we have the stilling of the mind, Samadhaham Chittang. That was also part of that Sutta. Yeah? So what we are seeing here is basically just an alternative expression to what we found in the mindfulness of breathing Sutta. There are similar qualities that are being developed through meditation. So what we are seeing here is meditation practice. We're seeing the psychology of meditation, uh, the first-person experience of what meditation should feel like when we get it right. Uh, 
Yeah, and again, it's very, it's very attractive. It's all about good qualities, starting with joy, then the rapture, then the tranquility, then the sukkha, the bliss, and then eventually the stillness of the mind. Uh, super duper attractive. Uh, yeah, it's all about bliss uh, and stillness all the way through. That's all meditation really is about. Uh, and then insight at the end of it all. Uh, can't get much better than that. Uh, yeah, you, you gain, you, you, you pursue bliss uh, so that you can become wiser. Isn't that extraordinary? Huh? To me that's really extraordinary. Huh? Bliss <coughs> is the path to wisdom in Buddhism. Huh? The Buddha says in one of the suttas, the, uh, the Bodhiraja Kumara Sutta, Majjhima Manikaya 85, uh, and uh, there Bodhiraja Kumara, which means Prince uh, Bodhi, uh, that's what it means, uh, uh, he has a uh, he has this conversation with the Buddha and uh, he says to the Buddha, yeah, you know, bliss can only be attained through suffering. Yeah. And this is one of these very common human understandings, yeah, no pain, no gain kind of idea. Yeah, this is a very British uh, term, no pain, no gain. Uh, and uh, actually, it's not just the British, everyone in the around the world seems to think like that, right? Uh, and you go to the Jain ascetics, and they were, of course, into that kind of thing. And you go to Christianity, they're kind of into whipping themselves. Uh, and if you, you know, all, all of this stuff, uh, right? Uh, and so no pain, no gain, is kind of, seems to be very deeply lodged in human psychology. Uh. So this Prince Bodhi says to the Buddha, well, you can't attain bliss, you have to attain bliss through suffering. Uh. And the Buddha says, well, that's what I used to think as well, before my awakening. Yeah. Again, the Buddha, had, the Buddha to me had a wrong view of her. Yeah? He didn't understand reality. Yeah. So that, but that turned out to be wrong. Yeah. Actually, the right understanding is bliss begets bliss. Yeah. If you have the right kind of... But you have to define bliss in the right way. Yeah? Yeah? It, it's not the bliss of the five-sense world, yeah? but it's the spiritual kind of bliss. Yeah? And if you get the spiritual kind of bliss and happiness, it gives rise to more bliss and happiness. Yeah? if you then lead your mind in the right way, ultimately leading to wisdom itself. Bliss upon bliss upon bliss, leading to wisdom. It's just so super duper attractive. It's like, if this is on offer, I'll have it. Don't you feel like that? How can one not be attracted to these teachings? It's like, if this is real, okay, I'm in, this is it, I'm going to practice this path and see what happens. Of course, it is easy to say. It takes a lot of commitment, uh, and uh, it is not doesn't always, you know, it's not always a smooth ride, as they say, and a kind of kind of bliss just happens like that. Uh, it does take a very specific kind of commitment, uh, but it is there, and it is possible if you apply yourself in the right way. Uh, and this is the power of this. Uh. So. You become immersed in samadhi, yeah, or you become the mind becomes stilled, uh, so you attain samadhi, uh, and then it doesn't go beyond that, it stops there. Uh, and the reason is because uh, not all suttas take it all the way to the end, but of course, once you have samadhi, then the potential for insight is there, and the potential for ending the whole uh, business, yeah, the end of suffering and all of that also arises from that. Uh. And then uh, the Buddha says this is called a noble disciple disciple who lives in balance uh, among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they've entered the stream of the teaching uh, and they develop the recollection of the Buddha. Yeah, you are in balance because your mind is in balance. Uh, you're no longer kind of buffeted around by desires and aversions and ill will, uh, but your mind is kind of smooth. Uh, and uh, you, you will notice that it's very nice to have a mind that is kind of smooth, that doesn't kind of go up and down like this, uh, but it's kind of balanced in the world. Uh, yeah, it means that you have the ability to react in wise and intelligent ways when you meet other people. Uh, you have a bit more distance, uh, you have a bit more mindfulness, a bit more clarity. Uh, you're able to react in the right way. Uh, you have that sense of balance in your life. Uh, it's very nice to have that balanced kind of mind. Uh, uh, it's a kind of lower, it's kind of a kind of equanimity. It's actually called upeka in the sutta. It's this lower kind of upeka, not the higher upeka of the jhanas, but it's the more ordinary kind of upeka, the equanimity. Yeah. You are untroubled among people who are troubled, right? You have found happiness. You have found peace. You're able to live life in an entirely new way. Yeah. You no longer feel that the world is troublesome in the same way. Yeah. And uh, so you're living a life that is far higher quality than what you used to have. Uh. And this is also very much part of the Buddhist path. Uh. 
the quality of life improves as you practice this path. It gets better and better and better. It is not just a distant goal. It is actually improvement right now, in the here and now, if you live it well. And people often say that. When you move from living an ordinary life, maybe you do things that are not quite right all the time. You lie a bit here and you do a, bit, a few dodgy things. Many people say that you know lying is kind of common in the world. But uh, as a monk, I don't think I ever really lie, actually. Uh, do I ever lie? Have I lied in my monastic life? Uh, maybe once or twice in 30 years? I don't know. It's very, very rare. Uh, it doesn't seem to be necessary to lie. It's, it's pos quite possible to live with uh, uh, truthfulness and that kind of integrity. Uh, and this is kind of uh, what happens uh, then. Uh, yeah? You um, become untroubled in the world. Uh, and then lastly, they have entered the stream of the teaching yeah, uh, and developed the recollection of the Buddha. Yeah. Enter the stream of the teaching here basically means you are a stream enterer again. So now it comes back to where we started out with Mahanama being a stream enterer. Yeah, and uh, you develop the recollection of the Buddha. And of course, again, if you are a stream enterer, then uh, developing the recollection of the Buddha is really, really easy yeah, because you know what it means, uh, because you have attained uh, similar kind of things yourself. Uh, and for everyone else, they have to try a little bit harder and, and try. But it doesn't mean it is just for stream enterers. Uh, it is for all of us. Uh. So uh, see if, you, if this is something that works for you. Uh, some, for some of you, it may not work or it may not feel right. Uh, in which case, there's five more recollections coming soon. Uh, we're going to have a look at those. We're going to have to go through those a little bit faster because this retreat is too short. Uh, yeah, every retreat is too short. You always come to the end and there's more to be done there. Yeah? Everyone is not an arahant yet, so there's more to be done there. So, uh, unfortunately. But we will see if we can do as much as... Uh, we, we, we'll try to go through all of the suttas. Uh. And of course, once you have kind of established the Buddha, then from the Buddha comes the Dhamma, the teaching. From the Dhamma comes the realization of this teaching, the Sangha. From the Sangha comes the ideas of... Uh, living virtuously and gen with generosity. So all of these other uh, recollections, uh, they emerge from the understanding of the Buddha. So this is the most f foundational insight, is the insight into who the Buddha was uh, and understanding his qualities. Uh. So that is all for now. So please keep on enjoying yourself. There will be some more interviews at a quarter past ten. So please come over uh, uh, if it is your turn. Uh, uh, and then uh, please have a nice meal, and then Aya Benubupeka will be doing some more Gandhi meditation at 2.30 this afternoon.